I remember one, an old relative of mine that died in 1960. She used to say, if it wasn't for the good people, we wouldn't be here. Her folks used to tell her these things. She said, because at one time there was a move to to sweep us off the face of the earth. She said, but there's too many good people. And today I rely on that. I never did forget that. Sanatsi tamutakko no katakko hanno naxa ayaki tukumiaso kani anno khoi hita isa isa utkum ekstiko hanyaki tanatsi tamutakko kiamo maki nikiske mami anno sta pot ita pot nikstanatsi tamutakko natsaya i tamanatsi anno kinno ka Ah, from time immemorial, you know, we look at time so differently. We could say, you know, back then. When this world was created, it was the water that was created first. When the water was created, it spoke a promise. I am going to take care of the Indian people. I am going to give life to everything. And then the land was created. And the land spoke a promise. I am going to take care of the Indian people from the day they are born till the day they die. And these are the foods that are going to take care of them. And then the first one, first food that was created was the salmon, then the deer, then the roots and the berries. And then it was the man, and then the woman. That man and that woman were given a belief to take care of everything that was created before them. And that's what we do today. With our religion, we take care of everything that we're dependent on. Water to us is most sacred. When we say, look at our sacred mountain, Pato, or Tahoma, people will misconstrue that and say, oh, that must be their wonderful God. And we look at it and we go, oh yeah, yeah, if you say so. But to us, water is the giver of life. If we don't have water, we perish. The mountain that takes the cold air creates snow, and then the sun that melts that snow and brings down the streams gives the life to everything, all life, animals, insects, birds, humans. We all come from that water. Every time you go to our table, once we say choose, you take that water and you take a sip in respect to it and you put it down. And then we go to our first foods, our roots, our salmon that comes back to us every year. And then we go on to all, all the way to the end of the season. And then once we finish our meal, we go into reminding our people of the laws that was how we got the water, how we got the roots, how we got the salmon, how we got the eels, the sucker, and everything else. And we remind ourselves that we're not above it or we're not below it, but we are on equal terms with all animal, all fish, all insects, because we all play a major role in our world that we live in. Ka kemi te aki pi a ampetiki le lechens e iwachima. You kami te aki pi taku ota iwagrake. The Lakota way of life is one that uh, views life as our mothers view life. 
Why? Because our mothers teach us love. And without love, uh, this thing that we call life just becomes a game. And we learn that love the first nine months of our life as our mothers carried us. So the reverence and respect for the female amongst our Lakota society must continue on. My grandmother had a house down here, my dad's mother, a log house. It was in December, I went down there and I told her, Kene you know, I told her, tell me a coyote story. She said, She said, no, all the animals that hibernate haven't gone in yet. So you gotta wait till everything goes to in hibernation before the, and you wait for the, for the trees that are, that are water soaked to, to pop. The coyote stories come out. That's because at that time till spring, the people wanted to protect the animals that were big, that were going to have little ones, the elk, the deer and stuff. So you left everything alone. You made sure you had enough wood and stuff to settle in for the winter. That's when the stories come out. You honor the, the creatures when it's real cold because they're having it rough too. And a lot of the animals are uh, seeking refuge on reservations. You know, that's, that's really something. You know, they live along our river bottoms. Even the fish, you know, the bull trout, you know, is, a lot of them are in, on, the, on those rivers that border our reserves or go through our reservation, you know. And as we sit here, there's noises back here. The, the, the bear was a prairie animal, you know. How, today, let's just start from today, and just, just, just a quick. How many Indians have you heard being mauled by a bear? None come to my mind. But they roam the uh, prairie. How we were able to live with them, you know. I mean, we were, it was like saying they had every right to, to be there. One of the, the descriptions for the, the hills that Lakota people have used is the heart of all that is. When a certain constellation was above uh, this location and then this location, we were to conduct ceremony. So all the people knew that, and, and just based by uh, watching out for the stars, that we were to be in the Black Hills at certain times of the year and we were mandated, that was our uh, spiritual law, we were to conduct these ceremonies. Of course, with uh, development and the westward expansion, uh, a lot of those things were, were abruptly stopped. And the traditional peoples will, will adamantly tell you that uh, the westward encroachment and the modern expansion of this country, it was built on the backs and the blood of, of all the Indian people. Our very cultural uh, existence um, has been threatened and nearly destroyed, nearly exterminated. But um, Lakota people were real strong and we had those individuals who went underground with a lot of our beliefs and our practices and that's why we still have what we have. And if you could imagine, if we still had our, our, our uh, cultural uh, dictates in place, how strong we'd, we would still be real powerful because we had to, to work with our, the land and, and know these locations, and we had to know our, the, the constellations. And so the white people say, oh, how symbiotic. And I said, well, that's, you know, that's about the closest word in English that could describe us. We know this land. We know how to work with this land. We came from it. Our spiritual laws have, have mandated this. We have our own commandments. People really identified themselves with these specific areas as more Americans came in and the disease was so bad on people, well, people moved to one, you know, consolidated to villages and people really became known as that, you know, those things. There were all kinds of villages that truthfully I don't think, you know, we'll never know the name of. And there's lots of villages we know the name of that don't have any we don't even know of specific people there other than maybe some myth person or something, some old person that's talked about in a story. But, you know, that's just the nature, I guess, of what happened through disease, everything. 49 years and seven months after the expedition came through here, the Nez Perce 
all the bands and nations of Yakima, the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, Palouse, were ceding more than 30 million acres of land. And by 1871, when old Joseph dies and tells his son to, to never let go of the land that holds his ancestors' bones, Joseph and his father and his, his brother Alaka know that they're in peril, that this is coming, that this is happening. And by 1871, when he dies, we're already fractionalized and split am amongst our relatives and our friends by Christianity, by treaties, by government intervention, by alcohol, by trappers and traders. The division and, and fractionalization has already become part of a way of life. And by 1877, when they go into exile, it is a mere distance in time from when the expedition came through. And for us, it's only a couple generations ago that it, that exile began. And so this year, 2002, we are now um, in exile, 125 years. And so as we face the 200-year 200, 200 anniversary of the Lewis and Clark expedition, we can't look at those dates without looking at the consequence. The consequence is tremendous. Clark's son was named Halach Tukit. Uh, an interpretation is that he, it's a daytime smoker. And he never spoke English. All he could say was, me Clark, me Clark, because he knew who he was. And he had some of uh, Clark's features. He had kind of a dark red hair and light colored eyes. And uh, he went through the War of 1877 that we had with the United States Army went through all the battles and then died in exile in Oklahoma. The government would come and chase the children around and just grab them and kidnap them and take them off to school against the parents' wishes or anything. And the parents would try to hide their children, run into the uh, mountains, run into the brush, hide them under the beds, try to hide them from all those uh, people, officials coming to take them away to school. And they were forced to go into those schools and then they were forced to be stripped of their natural clothes and their languages. Uh, they were punished severely, severely for speaking their Indian languages because they had to learn how to speak English because we were uncivilized savages and, we, and they wanted us to be like them. White hair rabbit is Mahti Mahti Shot. Okay, Mahti Shot. There is nowhere where I can just walk out that door and go any any direction in a community and start talking Mandan. There's no one I don't have anyone to speak Mandan to here in a community. So I just keep that Mandan language to myself. And, and passing it on to the young students of like what you saw, you know. I do, you know, miss my language that I could speak, speak to someone, my native tongue, uh, and as well as I like to speak my Hiraza language, because I speak Hiraza language too. So when somebody comes to say able to speak the language, I, I, I feel very good of speaking and hearing them speak in the language that I'm able to speak. And it's even much more better if I can hear someone speaking Mandan to me, because that was my first language, and my English language, and the Hiraza came in later. My first language was Blackfoot, and my view was based on that. And I suppose there would have been no uh, other perspective if it wasn't for me going to school, then all of a sudden, I started realizing that, uh, yeah, there's there's two worldviews, and the one that I'm most familiar with and comfortable was the one that uh, I was brought up with. At the Warm Springs Elementary, we were teaching 89 kids a day. We were there half an hour every day, and this is more Wasco language that anybody's heard in decades and forth. And 
Now we teach nine kids uh, on Monday evenings, one time a week. We um, were told that the No Child Left Behind Act was to encompass you know, the community, the needs of the community. And what it did was it left um, our communities out. We were teaching them the language, we was teaching them songs, we was teaching them dances, uh, we was also teaching them the culture of the Wasco people. Because what most people don't understand is that, you know, every tribe had their own culture. And that's what we were bringing back. And, you know, now we don't have that access to the children to let them know about our people. For years, you know, people have been collecting the bones of Native Americans, setting them on their shelves. And people just taking things um, back with them to just to have a, a piece of our culture, I guess. One of these um, remains have come back to my office. And whoever this person was that collected this, you know, it was interesting to him and he kept it in his house where his family lives. And his sons grew up with this and after you know, they moved away from, from this house or whatever. This skull remained inside this house. And a contractor working on the house because he didn't want his wife to, to be affected by this, put it in the back of an old pickup outside the house. And then a person bought this pickup, was concerned about this skull in the back of the pickup, and called my office and says, I have this and I want to return it to you. And so it goes from something out of curiosity to maybe a piece of trash. And these are the things that you know, we experience, the things that affect us. And so I always think of it as, you know, would you want your grandpa's skull going around the back of your pickup? You know. Why do they have to take this with them? I mean, our, our culture is really, really important to us. Um, to me, it seems like they don't have anything behind them to fall back on, so they have to come and take something from us back with them. That don't make them a part of us, though. Indian people have never had voices in interpretation of the expansion of the Northwest, simply because they ne we were never considered experts. We didn't have a PhD behind our name to say that, oh yeah, we know all this stuff about Native Americans. And so then nobody came to us to ask us anything. And you know, they came and interviewed us and said, oh yeah, this is great, there's a real quaint Nesper story. And the way that story would go. Lewis and Clark wrote a lot of things based on who they were, and they jotted a lot of things down. And whether they were right or wrong is irrelevant to students that look at their, their, their writings and will make conclusions based on that and will come to us and say, well, we've got to set you straight. You know, and it's not just Lewis and Clark. It's been a number of people that have come to us. Uh, Vine Deloria got into a lot of trouble when he did a whole uh, chapter on anthropologists. It didn't matter how wrong their conclusions were. If, if, if that's all it did was for them to be uh, wrong and get degrees based on that, that would have been one thing. But U.S. Indian policy was based on that was erroneous. Uh, conclusions and today expert witnesses in that field still uh, testify on behalf of the government for land claims and yet I have never seen these people they don't come out they don't know the language and they'll say things like 
mythology is erroneous, misleading. You know, how do you know? When, as I was growing up through school, I can recall, especially because it was during sort of the Red Power movement, the 60s and the 70s, I can remember people saying, and, and more recently, elected officials in the Northwest saying, those are old documents gathering dust on the shelves. Why do you keep bringing that treaty up? The attitude is, with treaties, is that, you know, the federal government gave the Nez Perce tribe in the treaty. They didn't give us anything. They didn't give us anything. They took. They took from us a lot. And what we did as a people, as we reserved through those treaties, some rights, you know, hunting and fishing and gathering. When I'm out gathering, I always think about what did our people do before contact with Europeans? What, what was it like when they, when they went out and gathered? And, um, and what were the foods like? Because everywhere we go now, it's, um, our foods are, are really being affected by um, the impact of this being a farming region. Where, where we go out today, there's fences put up by farmers, no trespassing signs. You can't get into them places. Um, there is a place where I go where we can get in, and the roots are plentiful there. Um, a lot of places where uh, we gather our foods, I mean, even up in, in Weeip, where a lot of the uh, carrot grows, there's um, they're spraying those fields with something because the, the roots are just like like shriveling up. There are plenty of Chinooks who should and want to make a living fishing. They want to be able to fish and sell that fish. Me, myself, if I caught enough fish to sell it, that's fine. Pay for the gas in a boat. But my interest is the food. We can't be Chinook Indians unless we're eat, eating fish. You know, we need that fish, sturgeon, salmon. We need those things, smelt, our flounders. Those are food we have to have to be Chinook Indians. And that, that's where my frustration is. Because how do we raise a kid up to be a Chinook Indian if we don't have it, if we don't have fish? That's what I want. And that's where federal recognition is essential to us. There's a lot of things that are gone now, a lot of traditions that we, we don't practice anymore. But that doesn't mean that that's over. I mean, many of us are trying to follow uh, a, a way to get back into where we, where we used to be. And I think that's important. So when I look back, what, what it means to me and how am I going to do this with my children? I mean, my focus is to let them know that you're going to be the keepers for your people. You're not just, it just ain't going to be just for you, just for our family. It's for all the Arikara people that we can give this to. So whenever you're, when you become, you know, elders, if you're ever called upon, you'll be able to, to do what you know because you were taught the way it was supposed to be done. So that's what I look at when I think about these things. By the time the sesquicentennial observance of the Treaty of 1855 coincides with the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial in 2005 in our homeland, we would like our neighbors and our children to understand here that this is the place we call home. And in this homeland, all of the places had names before Lewis and Clark came, and the names are still there if we keep the language alive. The names are still there if we take care of the places because our language is actually a reflection of the ecosystem. We don't have words in our languages for art, citizen, treaty, boundary, reservation, but we have words for other things that are very important to us that reflect the relationship. The names of things are actually stories. Every place and every person has a story. And the story is how they get their name. And you can't take the name in isolation. You take the story and the landscape and the ecosystem 
part and parcel, the whole thing together. It's a whole idea and they don't get separated. And if we separate those, if we break those connections, we have disrupted our culture even further. And I think now it's time for the um, American Indian people to share their own stories, to write their own stories, and they can correct some of the things that have been written about them. I would really like to see the histories to finally be told from the tribal perspective. Uh, it's a perspective that's been long overlooked. It was a time for healing, not with the, only the Native Americans, but with the non-Native Americans. When President Jefferson sent out the core discovery, he wanted physical connection from sea to shining sea. Here in the 21st century, and again, we look at it, and also the turmoil that our country is in, I think what we need now from sea to shining sea is a spiritual connection. We've come through thousands and thousands of, of challenges in, in, on this Turtle Island, what the United States likes to call its territory, and uh, we'll get through this. We'll get through this with them if they want to come with us, uh, but we'll get through it. Thank you very much. I think the thing that I would like to see come away from this, uh, from this bicentennial is the rewriting of history. And perhaps rewrite is the wrong term. Perhaps we should view it as correcting history.